So this is the whole of Omar Beach, whole four miles of it. Now this video is about what happened after D-Day. I've got two videos on what happened on D-Day on Omar Beach. This is going to be about the 7th to the 10th. Well, here we see the whole length of Omar Beach. In the distance, you can see the headland. That's Pointe de Ra. There was a radar station on that. And then further around than that is Pointe de Hoc, where the range is scaled. Can't see that. But the far end of the beach, there's sheer cliffs. And Company C of the 2nd Ranger Battalion scaled those cliffs to attack a strong point on top of the cliffs there. The far end of the beach is Dog Green, and that's what uh, Saving Private Ryan represented. Of course, there was no Captain Miller sent to find any Private Ryan or even Fritz Nyland, but that's what it represented, and that was the worst part of the beach. So the 29th Division were landing that end of the beach. First Division, this end of the beach, two divisions landed here in the four miles. So Dog Green is at the far end of the beach where you can see some white buildings. And that's the draw that goes up to Verville. There's three villages over Omar Beach, Verville, Saint Laurent and Colville. In the middle is a draw that goes up to Saint Laurent. You can just about see the sculpture on the beach called the Brave. That's at the bottom of Le Moulin. On the skyline over there, you see some dark trees, and you just see a flagpole sticking up behind them. That's the American Cemetery. And then just this side of the cemetery, the WN62, which was the last strong point to hold out, held out to about half past three in the afternoon. And then just this side of that is the draw that goes up to Colville. So that's WN62, just this side of the draw, WN61, and here we're on WN60. And that was the first strong point to be knocked out. You can see a mortar pit there, and the trenches are still visible. A General Cota landed in the middle of the farther part of the beach. He was instrumental in getting the 29th Division to get off the beach. He was up the top of the bluffs by nine o'clock. This end of the beach, the 1st Division landed and uh, Colonel Taylor was here. He said those famous words that in the longest day was said by Robert Mitchum who played General Cota. He said there's two types of men on the beach, those that are dead, and those that are gonna die, so let's get the hell out of here. So he was at this end of the beach and just below us here, the sheer cliffs start again and uh, that was Fox Red and that was the safest part of the beach. There's some famous photos of men sheltering at the bottom of those cliffs. So it's just below here, but the men here can't see them. So they were sheltered. Of course, a mortar could go down onto them, but they had no direct view onto them. Now, Didi on Omar Beach had nearly been a disaster. They were supposed to get to the main road, which is about eight miles inland, the N13 that is. They were supposed to get in the east towards Port and Bessin to join up with the British and in the west to Isigny and join up with 101st. And that didn't happen. All they managed to do was get on top of the bluffs. They got into Verville and the Germans still held half of Saint Laurent on the 7th and half of Colville. So they had a lot to do. On D-Day, Eisenhower was at Southwick House near Portsmouth. On the 7th, he was on HMS Apollo in the channel with Admiral Ramsey, watching the landings go ahead. Now, of the 3,300 vehicles that were supposed to come in, 500 of them were missing. And of the 2,500 tons of supplies that should have come in, only 100 tons had come in. Fortunately, some German officers inland still believed that Omar had failed, so they were concentrating on the British advancing inland from gold. On the 7th, work on Mulberry A had started. They started sinking ships, but that would be another video. 
So tap subscribe and the bell to be informed of the further videos. In St Laurel, General Cota was dismayed to see a group of soldiers who weren't advancing. He asked the captain why. He said, there's Germans firing at us from that house. So Cota said to the captain, get your men to fire at the house. And Cota, with a group of men, went round to one side and then shouting and hollering, they ran towards the house and threw grenades through the windows. The surviving Germans went out the back door. He said to the captain, now you know how to clear out the house. Now the 29th had learned how to get on beaches, but the officers hadn't been taught how to clear out Germans from the house. They had a lot to learn. The second division was coming in on the 7th. This famous photo shows them coming up this slope. On the 7th, work on the airfield A21 started. It was here on the top of the bluffs overlooking the beach at Saint Laurent. This is the Rouquet draw, which was the first one opened up. Now this airfield was supposed to be at Verville, the other end of the beach. The Germans still held that area. And so they put the airfield here. Planes were landing here on the afternoon, but the airfield wasn't finished till the 10th of June. And this is where Patton landed on the 6th of July, a month after D-Day. Of course, he wasn't involved directly in D-Day. The 175th Regiment of the 29th Division was landing on the 7th. The General Gerhardt wanted them to land at Verville, which is up there, so they could go right up the draw into Verville and carry on towards Gucci. But the Navy said it was too, uh, there too many obstacles there still and the, on the beach. And so they landed them at uh, Le Moulin in the middle of the beach. And so the men had to walk half the length of the beach. The past dead bodies were still on the beach. So it was pretty bad for morale. They had to go right down the beach to Verville. On the 7th, the 2nd Battalion, 28th Regiment of the 1st Division were trying to cross the River Roar, which is in the valley here, between Surin and Roussy. They came under fire from German artillery at Hoodville, which is just further down the valley, and Argu Chateau, which is just behind those trees there. Lots of Sherman tanks came up and drove the Germans off, who retreated towards the 226, led by Lieutenant Colonel Daniel, they take these crossroads in the afternoon of the 7th. Meanwhile, reconnaissance patrols sent along the N13 show that Tourne Bessin is firmly held by the Germans. Lieutenant Colonel Daniel asks for an air raid on Tourne Bessin on the morning of the 8th. And at 11.30, the first men went in. But it wasn't until 8.30 p.m. that the town was finally taken with tanks and infantry. Adorin Bessin is about a mile down there, and Bayeux is about two miles that way. And here, on the 12th, they started building ALG 13. It wasn't ready to the 20th. It was used by Thunderbolts and B-26 bombers. On the 8th, the 326, led by Lieutenant Colonel Corley, entered the outskirts of Vietram with light resistance. But when they tried to cross the River Or, it was fiercely contested. So the night of the 8th, the USS Baldwin shelled the town and the Americans took it on the 9th. And then they joined up with the 50th Division who landed on Gold Beach. And so the connection was secure. That is saint honore de Pelt, past the cliffs there is Omar Beach. Now on top of these cliffs here was WN 59 and that's where Major Puscat said he was on the morning of the 6th. But he probably wasn't. Now just here they set up a terminal to bring in uh, gasoline and diesel. So there was a pipe with um, connection in the sea and the Tankers could come in, they connect onto the pipe, and the gasoline and diesel will go inland, following a pipe 
physical Pluto Minor. Well, there was another one at Fort Besson. And later on they put the pipeline to Sherbrooke. But this is how they brought it in in the beginning. This hill next to Etram is called Mont Colvin. And on the 10th they set up reservoirs here to take diesel and gasoline coming in from the pipeline from saint andre de Pierre. Port non bessin had been taken on the night of the 7th by the 47 Royal Marine Commando. On the night of the 7th, two commandos were scouting along by the River Ore. They crossed over and came under fire, so they came back to the other side. They then heard some voices speaking in English. There were two American scouts from the 1st Division. On the 8th, the 1st Division, 3rd Battalion, 16th Regiment, took the German garrison at Cabourg relatively easily and continued to Pont Bessin. British commandos who met them said, You're Americans? They said, No, we're Texans. Metcalf of the 1st Battalion, 116th, had lost about half his battalion on D-Day. Men of the 2nd and 3rd were added on to form a relief force to go to Pont de Hoc. The Rangers were being hard pressed by the Germans and were holding out around the flat casement at the battery. Captain Charles Corton wrote a very interesting book called The Other Clay. And he was part of the men going towards Pont de Hoc to relieve the Rangers. And he had to go back towards Omar Beach for some reason and he passed a pump like this and it was surrounded by some men and there was lots of insignia on the ground. He asked them why the insignia were on the ground. They said, well, the Germans are firing officers and non-commissioned officers. So we've ripped all their insignias off. But they're obviously looking for any excuse not to go forward to the front line. Of course, and thought, if I was a sort of officer that could rally the men, it would have got them going. But he wasn't like that, and he was going the other way anyway. So he's left them there, and he thought well, they're bound to get swept up in the flow anyway. The men and tanks moving towards Pointe de Hoc arrived near it at 11 a.m. on the 7th, but came up against stiff resistance. Although they couldn't get in, they were keeping the pressure off the rangers. Some tanks went back to Omar Beach to reload. The site of this photo is recognisable by the buildings. On the 8th, they continued the attack, finding the German resistance had slackened. Firing at the sound of German guns, they realised that they were firing at rangers who had taken guns off the Germans. Once Pointe de Hoc was relieved, the next obstacle was Grand Camp, just over the brow of the hill over there. This stream here had been dammed, so the whole of this valley was flooded. The bridge across it was still intact, but they couldn't get across it. Even tanks couldn't make any headway. They even lost a tank to a mine. But the deadlock was broken by Frank Peregrine. Frank Peregrine got over the bridge down there. He went towards the top of the cliffs and came along the cliff tops. He came this way. There were trenches down here. He got into the trench and using his M1 and grenades, he took some prisoners and then he pushed them prisoners in front of him along the trench. And the trench ended up at this machine gun position. And finally he took 35 prisoners single-handedly. He got the Medal of Honor for that. He survived the action, but was killed a few days later on the 14th of June. He's buried in the American Cemetery at Omar Beach. At that time, Maisie was a separate village from Grand Camp. There were two gun batteries at Maisie. They were taken by the 5th Rangers on the 9th. That will be the subject of another video, so tap subscribe to be notified. The 116th Regiment were then in reserve for a few days and could relax in Grand Camp or La Combe. You might recognise this as the Lacombe German Cemetery and wonder what this has to do with American soldiers. At Lacombe there was a camp, a hospital and an American cemetery set up. In 1947 the Americans were moved and it became one of six German cemeteries.
General Gero wanted the River L to be crossed in two days. General Gerhard, the commander of the 29th, he ordered the River Or to be crossed. The 115th arrived at Longville at about noon on the 8th. Colonel Slappy decided to send a patrol out across the floods and Lieutenant Kermit Miller's 3rd platoon of the E Company were selected. They set out about 1730. Most of the men in Miller's platoon were from Chesapeake Bay, so they knew all about marshes and they found a boat to help them get across. They were heading towards Colombia over there. about two miles across. We came to the road to Colombia which was just guarded by three relaxed Germans. Uh, they didn't expect anybody to be coming across the floods. So they captured them without a shot being fired. Then a Frenchwoman showed them where there was a building full of Germans. So Miller got his men to surround the building and he called the Germans to surrender. Well, they weren't having that. So a violent skirmish ensued while the fighting was going on. Some German reinforcements turned up, but that didn't change the outcome. Several German soldiers were killed in the combat. 17 were taken prisoner. Three 29ers were wounded. Though so Miller took his men to a barn and they could sleep through the rest of the night. And then they made the journey back across the floods, which was difficult because as well as the prisoners to contend with, they had the wounded men. Uh, Miller got the DSC for his action there. As soon as they had handed over their prisoners and the wounded men, Miller and his platoon recrossed the swamps to join the battalion that took over Colombia, now empty of Germans. The first battalion now followed across the floods, and when they got to Colombia, they turned left to go towards Brickville. Private First Class Moore saw a German tank escorting some American prisoners back to the German lines. He and another man confronted the tank, shouting to the prisoners to disperse. Then Moore fired a grenade at the tank, which fired back, and First Class Ford was with him. He was killed. Fortunately, other men turned up to attack the tank and the tank was forced to retreat. During the night of the 7th, the 175th moved out from Gruchy, and then they hadn't gone far before they stopped for three hours. Some men slept a bit, and then they got on the main road, which is the N13 here, and they were coming towards La Combe. As they approached La Combe, they came under fire from machine guns, and even one of the accompanying tanks was knocked out by an 88mm gun. The Americans were about to launch a concerted attack when the Germans pulled out. Apparently, they were just happy to slow down the Americans. The rest of the column of the 175th was approaching La Combe when they were taken for Germans by some typhoons which came along strafing, sending in rockets and bombs. Six men were killed. This was the first action they'd had, and they became victim of friendly fire. It was 1am on the 9th, as the 175th approached Dissigny. The town had been bombarded by Navy guns, and they could hear the drone of bombers receding that had just bombed the town. Coater and two other men ran to the bridge, and they found it hadn't been blown. Coater said they hadn't even blown it. The bridge is over the River Or, and that way goes out to the, the estuary. Captain Schlingluff 
he said the town looked like somebody picked it up and dropped it. Colonel Goud chose Lieutenant Del Cazal to take the news back to headquarters at Omar Beach. He had a driver and a jeep. They set off along the uh, N13 towards Formigny to go to Omar Beach. Instead of going down the main road towards Formigny to get to Omar Beach, Lieutenant Del Cazal instructed the driver to turn off down the road that went to Grand Camp to go along the coast. That turned out to be a bad idea. They hadn't gone far when they were stopped by some scruffy Ostrupen soldiers. Lieutenant Del Cazal, with sign language, tried to get them to surrender to them, but the Ostrupen were more worried about what would happen to them if they were taken prisoner again by the Germans. And so they kept Del Cazal prisoner, and the driver of course, for 24 hours. And then they suddenly surrendered to them. So it took 24 hours for the news of Vicini being taken to get to headquarters. Having secured Vicini, the 175th set off towards Lison, accompanied by tanks of the 747th Brigade. About a mile short of Lison, they came under fire from the 352nd. 150 Germans were killed in this exchange. Later in June, the first railway service organised by the Allies went from Liaison to Isigny. The 2nd Battalion, 115th, crossed the floods along the road from Lacombe towards Vouilly on the 9th, heading for the River Elle, the next objective. The road was underwater, but weasels brought up pontoon bridges to help. From the Bois de Calette, the Germans had a great view across the valley. It wasn't until 1900 hours that the German artillery was silenced and the battalion could continue. The 2nd Battalion, 115th Regiment, they crossed the marshes near Vouy, which is that way, but then they'd gone wrong and they'd been going that way towards La Folie and they should have been coming this way. So they ended up coming down this road here. The Major Clift was looking for a bivouac for them to spend the night. He wanted one off the main road, so he found one just down here. Private First Class Lehman was in the jeep coming up the rear of the battalion. They heard some noise of tracks behind them. They thought they were weasels. They stopped and one man got out and went back down the road. They heard a shot and he was killed. In fact, there were some Germans coming. So this is the field that Major Cliff had chosen for the bivouac. It's some way from the Carrefour. Each company was sent into a different sector. Some men were so tired, or exhausted in fact, they just laid down with all their gear on and went to sleep. Now those tracks that Private First Class Lehman had heard was in fact a German combat team They'd been sent to Colombier to counter the advance of the Americans. But while they were on their way there, they were told by radio that Colombier had been taken. So they were told to go back towards saint Lo. And they were trying to avoid the main roads. That's why they came down that minor road to the Carrefour. And then they came down here and found their way blocked by this group of Americans who had mainly gone to sleep. The Germans approached the hedges, firing mortars, machine guns into the field. Tanks had their guns pointing over the top of the hedges. It was a massacre. It seemed like the whole battalion was going to be lost, but some men actually got away. Now there's a medic with a group of men walking down some lane. They were overtaken by a French girl, and she told them where there were Germans and how to get past them, and she led them some way. And finally they met up with some Americans. It was the 175th near Liaison, which is that way now. On the same day, the 175th linked up with 101st at Katz, or Ka as it's pronounced. This D-Day objective had taken four days. They had advanced eight miles south of the D-Day objective. The next mission was to take San Lo. They didn't know yet, but that was going to take another five weeks. And before they could hope to achieve that, they had to cross the River Elle. 
tap subscribe to be informed of these videos. There are several easy ways you can help the channel. You can tap on like, tap on subscribe plus the bell, make comments, ask questions or even on Patreon. Here are some videos you might like to watch.